In today's lecture, we'll be talking about uh, more algorithms uh, that are used for sensor fusion. Now, in the last week, we did not finish completely uh, the algorithm for noise reduction. So, uh, I will finish that and uh, then we'll go to the topic for today. So, last week, I've been talking about uh, how to reduce noise if you have uh, two signals from uh, two sensors of the same variable and uh, at the very end I was showing you an example uh, how to use this if uh, the noise is uh, not correlated. Now the question is uh, what will happen if uh, we have a correlated noise so that for some reason the noise on those two signals is the same so it's not independent and how will this affect uh, the calculation? And uh, I will show you an extreme case. An extreme case means that uh, I will use signal x1 equal to signal x2. So I will use exactly the same signal. And uh, the question is if this will improve the signal quality. If uh, I will be able to reduce the noise. And uh, the obvious answer to this extreme case is that it will not improve the signal at all. Uh, the reason is simple, because if this will, would work, I could take just one signal, I could use the processing algorithm and this would give me reduced noise. So this obviously would be great, but it's not, it's not the case. So uh, if I want to reduce the noise, I need to use signals with uh, different sources. So in reality, uh, it will be somewhere between this extreme case where I have the same signals and uh, between the case that we discussed last week where the noise was not correlated. So the improvement of the algorithm will be somewhere in between. Let's take a look on uh, what is the contribution if I use uh, the fact that uh, the signals are correlated. So in, in uh, case the signals are correlated, it means that I will get less information about uh, the signals because the signals are dependent. So we need to judge the mutual dependence of the two signals. And uh, for this, we will use the covariance matrix. So here is an example of such covariance matrix for two signals. Here I have uh, the variance of signal 1, this is the variance of signal 2, and uh, this is the covariance between signal 1 and 2. And uh, my assumption will be that uh, the matrix is symmetric, in other words, that uh, the dependence of signal 2 on signal 1 is the same as the dependence of signal 1 on signal 2. So uh, we will use this covariance matrix in uh, the further calculations. Now the function that we are using is uh, still the same. We have been using uh, a weighted average basically. So the weight was uh, a factor that was telling us how much confidence do we have in the signal and uh, this SI, that's uh, our sample. So we are calculating the output as a sum, as a weighted, uh, weighted average of our samples. Uh, the only difference now will be that uh, this W, this, this uh, weight matrix now, vector, uh, that will be a matrix. Uh, in the previous calculations, uh, we did not use this as a matrix, we had just two numbers for two signals. But in general case you can write this as a vector or matrix equation. So we can calculate uh, what will be the covariance. Now this is just a derivation, we'll, I probably will not go uh, through, this, uh, through this slide that much. Just know that we need to calculate somehow what will be the covariance between the signals. Uh, Either we will need to make an estimate how this will be calculated or 
we will need to uh, use uh, some exact methods. So uh, if you would like to see how this calculation is actually done, uh, I recommend you to read this uh, to read this source, which describes in more detail uh, this uh, algorithm. Anyway, we can uh, calculate that uh, the weight that uh, we need in our calculation will be given by such relatively complicated equation. But here we see that uh, we have uh, the original variance and then we have the covariances, which uh, is the C1 here in the equation. So this means that the weight will be affected also by the covariance uh, of our two signals. So uh, let's see an example. Let's say I want to calculate what is the weight for my signal if I know the variance and if I know the covariance. Now this one, this is, uh, as you can see here, this is a unit vector, so it's a, it's a vector filled with ones. And uh, it's basically used just to recalculate from one format of the matrix to another one. So here I'm calculating the weight like this. I take the original variance, I subtract the covariance and so on and so on. This is uh, all described in the paper. It's not uh, important to remember this at all. Uh, at the end, we get uh, some vector that will describe us uh, the weights and we can use this in our equation. Now uh, this is like a complicated formula like that but the point here is that uh, if we have uncorrelated signals which was the case uh, in uh, our previous lecture now the covariance obviously will be zero. So this will be zero, this will be zero, this will be zero and all the parts with uh, the covariance uh, will be zero. So at the end we'll have uh, the same matrix like we have we had originally which will be a matrix uh, where we had uh, only the sigmas. Now to understand it better I uh, have here a numerical example. So let's say first that uh, we will have uh, an uncorrelated signal. That's what we had uh, previously. Uh, we will have uh, variance of uh, 0 0.1. So how do I calculate the weight matrix? Uh, I use the formula on the previous slide. I get that uh, the weight is 0 0.5 and 0 0.5. Now this is an obvious reason because I had the same variance here for both signals. So in my final result they will both have the same weights. Now, if I would have the variance of one signal larger, it means uh, it has a larger spread around the mean, so I will trust less in the signal. And this is what you can see here. So, one variance it has uh, 0 0.1 and the other one has 1. So, uh, sigma 2 squared is uh, 10 times larger than sigma 1. So this means that uh, the signal 2 has a much wider spread around the mean and I will place less confidence in this, uh, in this signal. So if I again use this calculation I'll find okay now 0 0.91 of my confidence will go to signal 1 and only 0.09 it will go to signal 2. So this is, this is for the uncorrelated signals. Now what will happen if uh, we have uh, some correlated signals? So we'll have the same example. We'll have uh, here 0.1 and 0.1 but now our signals are correlated and I have chosen just for the sake of um, some mathematical exercise that uh, the covariance of both signals is 0 0.2. Now do not search any reason behind those numbers, it's just an arbitrary choice. So for correlated signals we will calculate the covariance matrix. So this will be sigma 1 squared, this is sigma 2 squared, and uh, 
this is my covariance and I've chosen that it's symmetric. So if we substitute all this uh, into our equations uh, we'll get this formula quite long but uh, where are the numbers coming from? So uh, I'm calculating the variance of my fused signal and uh, we can find that uh, this part of uh, the formula we see 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 this is the sigma 1 times sigma 2 this is this, well no, not sigma but this is the, the weight that uh, I calculated and uh, here I have the 0 0.2 which is the covariance uh, in fact this is the formula that we are that we are doing we are summing the weights times uh, the original variance of our signal uh, then we have some term that looks like this so 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 times 0 0.1 this is uh, coming from the original variance that I had and the weight and then at the end we have again uh, 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 times uh, times 0 0.2 which is coming from the covariance times the original variance and uh, in fact this is the contribution from correlation so if the signals are correlated we'll get an additional terms that is added to the original variance and uh, if uh, the covariance uh, if this would be zero then this would be zero as well, this would be zero as well and we would get the same variance as we had uh, for the uncorrelated case so the same variance would mean that uh, this would be 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 times 0 0.1 and basically this part times this part which we already know that uh, if we use the signals with the same variance it will decrease us the variance of the final signal so if you have a correlated signal you calculate it like this uh, and this will give you the contribution in other words if you have correlated signals the reduction in uh, variance of the fuse signal will be always less will be smaller than uh, if you have uncorrelated signals so in reality we're somewhere between the uncorrelated case and uh, the case where the signals are the same. Now there is uh, some interesting video that I recommend you to take a look on it. It's about the basics of sensor fusion. Doesn't take very long, so uh, I suggest that you um, take a look uh, on this uh, quite interesting YouTube video. It shows the basic concepts of sensor fusion. And now uh, we will continue uh, with um, the algorithms uh, that uh, I would like to cover today. So uh, the next algorithm will be voting from multiple sensors. So let's imagine uh, we need to build uh, some system that is uh, critical and uh, that needs to be highly reliable. So we measure some variable, it could be airspeed, for example, it could be um, something that you have on the airplane, for example. And uh, here we have N inputs. And those inputs are coming uh, from independent sensors that measure the same variable. Then we have the voting algorithm that we will cover and uh, we want that we have just one signal available to our control system let's say that we are controlling the, the flight of an airplane and uh, this will be the speed sensor so we will have three or four or maybe more um, speed sensors and uh, a single output will go to the control system the autopilot which will control the, the thrust that we have on the, the motors so we have one signal at the output but since this is a critical system we want that uh, if one sensor fails it will not have an effect on our output so if there is a failure 
we still have a backup of uh, two or maybe more sensors that still measure the same variable. So we want that this output is error-free. Uh, we also want that uh, if, uh, let's say we have three sensors here, if one fails, we will get the info from the two others, but we can signal that there is something wrong. So in other words, we use the two other signals to produce our output, but we know that the third signal is significantly different and that there is something wrong. So we'll, we'll get a signal out that's, that this is an error. So we want an error output and we want to isolate the wrong signal from our output so that it has no effect. Uh, the output can be produced in two ways. Now the first is uh, that uh, you select directly one input as the output. So you select directly the variable, either randomly or based on some fixed numbering. So you select, okay, now I'm taking signal one as output, now I'm taking signal two as output if we detect that this is uh, an error-free signal. And uh, the second possibility is uh, that we combine somehow the signals that are OK and uh, we get the output signal. And we'll discuss both uh, algorithms. So let's take a look. So what happens if we select uh, one input? Now there are two algorithms that I will cover course there are even more. Uh, one is called exact majority voter and uh, the second one is called formalized majority voter. Now for the first case uh, you need to select one input. So let's say you have three inputs and uh, you want to select one of them and use it as your output. So you select the input when it has exactly the same value as uh, the majority of at least n plus 1 divided by 2 inputs. So in other words, you are looking for a threshold and you compare when it has uh, exactly the same value as the other ones. So you calculate, well I would not maybe call it an average, but uh, you take a look on the all other inputs and if your input is, has exactly the same value as the other ones, you will select it. And the second algorithm that is called formalized majority voter, uh, it will divide the inputs into several groups. So uh, you group the signals that are close together with some given threshold. Because obviously here, uh, for case A, it requires that you have exactly the same value, which is not very likely that uh, in, in, re in reality, if you ha have, uh, let's say, analog signals, uh, then uh, this would be impossible to fulfill. This is possible, for example, for logic signals, if we're talking about zero and one, then yes, exactly, we will have the same signal. But if we are talking about some sampled signals like temperature, humidity, speed, whatever, uh, it's not very likely that you will have exactly the same value. So for this case, the formalized majority voter is obviously uh, a much better option. So you take uh, the signal, you define some threshold. So let's say you measure temperature. And uh, from one sensor you have uh, 23.1, from another one you have 23.0, and from the third one you have 23.05, for example. So those signals are quite uh, close together. They are all near 23 centigrades. And uh, we can group those signals together. And uh, if the signal is in this group, we will send, select it randomly. If it's outside of this group, we will discard it and we'll say that this is a false signal. Or we can say that this, is, this belongs to another group, for example. So this is uh, selecting randomly uh, the signal as the output 
if it is inside of uh, your group. Now I have uh, an example here that I have prepared in MATLAB. So uh, the example that I will show you uh, uses uh, five sensors. Just because I found that this was like a good number, uh, you need at least uh, at least two, obviously. But uh, in in real systems, it is um, most uh, commonly at least three sensors. Because if you have just two sensors and one fails, you cannot tell that uh, there is an there. You can tell that there is an error because the signals are quite far away. But you don't have this redundancy anymore. So that's the reason why we use at least three. And uh, in my example, I have used uh, five. Uh, I have used uh, an example from uh, the airplane industry. So let me see. Oh, I don't have any. Maybe I have a picture on the very beginning. So this that is something like this. And uh, we have a sensor that uh, measures the angle of attack of uh, the airplane. It's uh, the angle with which the airplane flies, if it's climbing or if it's descending. So uh, that's quite an important variable. You're steering an airplane full of people, so you need uh, high robustness. So we'll have those signals on the input. Uh, here will be our voting algorithm and the output will be some selected signal that uh, is uh, reliable and it's selected by some algorithm out of, of uh, those input signals. So if one signal fails, we, it means that we lose quality of our signal, but uh, we do not use uh, the whole signal and we have some reliable info. So this is what I try to simulate here in MATLAB. So I have created um, a constant signal that uh, has a value of 10 and uh, then I have added a random noise. And this is a Gaussian white noise with some, uh, some parameters. So all the signals are initially the same, there should be 10 plus this noise which will be random. Now we can plot uh, the signal and uh, we'll see that something will happen. Uh, so just uh, take a look first on this chart above. Don't disregard the, the lower one for the moment. So here this is uh, my signal that I have from my simulated sensor. So the colors, they show me the samples that I get uh, from different sensors. They are all around uh, 10, which was my value plus the noise and you can see that uh, some of them is a little bit larger here some of them here it's a little bit smaller and so on it's very uh, the noise that I have uh, used by the way has the same parameters so I have used that uh, all the noise that I'm generating has the same variance which does not need to be the case but just uh, take it as, uh, as uh, given right now. Uh, and uh, now here we have uh, the algorithm that uh, we want to, to use. So uh, the way it's working is that I group the samples into a group. And uh, I will group them only if uh, they are below some given threshold. And this threshold, that's uh, a value that I have chosen. And I have chosen that, uh, where is it? Uh, it's here. So I have chosen that uh, the threshold is 0 0.25. Now if you look uh, in the chart here, 0 0.25. So it's somewhere around here, roughly. Um, so uh, if the signal is uh, below this threshold then it will belong to the group and if it is outside it will not belong to the group so if I magnify it like this 
then uh, we have 0 0.25 roughly somewhere here so for example for sample number two that we have here this is the second sample you can see it's uh, below 0.25 so the blue signal will belong to my group the green signal as well and the red signal as well they are both uh, close to the 10 but uh, for example the magenta signal here will not belong to my signal because uh, it is not part of the group and this is like uh, you need to make some tests uh, to see what threshold you need to set how reliable should it be uh, or uh, how many samples do you can do you reject obviously there is a trade-off between the interval between the threshold and between the fact that how many samples you have available if you make the threshold too small it may happen that uh, only one or maybe two or maybe not even not even one signal will fit into the into the selection and then you have a problem on the other hand if you make it too wide then you will have all the signals and uh, a spike for example like this may be a problem so it's always uh, dependent on the application that you are doing. So I would say that this is not a problem. You can see we have 10, we have 10.2, we have 9.7 roughly. So it depends on the accuracy that you want. Um, we could set it, uh, for example, to, I don't know, 12. So that if, uh, if uh, we have uh, two degrees difference between the two sensors, so let's say five de degrees, then it might be a problem and we want to indicate the, the error. So this is what's happening here. I'm going through all the samples that I have available from all the sensors and uh, I'm comparing that with the given threshold. And if it's below the, the given threshold, I will set one to some array that uh, I'm using and uh, if it is above the given threshold I will set zero and then this gives me a matrix that I have ones or zeros in the matrix and uh, if there is one it means that the sample belongs to the group and if it's zero it does not belong to the group so then what I do is that I count how many elements do I have that are not zero so how many signals are valid and uh, I select randomly uh, the signal so that's uh, that's this part of my signal and at the end I will select that this is my output signal that's coming from from uh, this selection and uh, I will plot the result which is this chart here and uh, by different colors you can see what signal was uh, selected at uh, what sample so for example here at sample number 30 the algorithm has selected uh, the signal that's marked in blue here which is uh, which is signal 5 for example here at sa sample number 10 it has selected uh, the the red one which is uh, uh, signal number 3 so you can see that it really randomly selects uh, the signal and uh, if one of the signals would be far away from the others, it will not be selected. So let's uh, let's uh, try it. So for example, let's say I will uh, change the properties of signal one. So now it will have uh, ten times larger variance than the other signals. Uh, and we will see that uh, on the chart. So signal one is the black one. So it's here it's fine it's uh, near the um, the uh, value of 10 and uh, here since this is a random signal uh, it's uh, really far away from my signal so you can see that here for example uh, sample number 20 sample number 19 and it is not selected in my threshold so around this peak I have detected that there is a problem with this signal. It's far away from my my 
threshold and it is not selected here. And the same would be probably found here. We can make it probably more obvious if I just uh, make it much worse. So let's uh, let's make it 10. So here we have uh, like a really bad signal from from signal uh, from signal one. Uh, you can see that it's almost never selected here in this chart, except here, which is sample 9, and sample 9 is somewhere here. We can see that this sample is quite close to all the others, so here it was selected. The same here, we have sample 17, which is probably somewhere here, so here it's closed, close, and uh, it was selected, and so on. So, uh, this would give us an idea how we can detect that this signal is obviously fault well one of the well, one of the possibilities so that's uh, that's it uh, the second possibility that uh, we have is that we combine the yeah I forgot the to translate this, this slide in check so let me just let me just do it. Um, for some reason, I forgot this slide. So the output is for this I translated all the slides but not this one so um, this combines the weighted average that we've seen on the beginning of the lecture uh, with uh, the selection of, uh, of the signal so uh, we will take the output as a weighted average so it means that uh, we take at least two signals, uh, we make a weighted average, and uh, we can uh, play with the weight. So for example, signal one can have more weight than signal two. Now there are more examples on this, for example, in this, uh, in this uh, link, uh, but you can take a look. Uh, I will not do this algorithm in MATLAB, but I will describe it uh, an, an example with a block diagram. Uh, and uh, this is uh, coming from this interesting source. It is an investigation of an um, airplane. I don't know if it was a crash or some accident. Maybe it's just an accident. Uh, and uh, that it's quite interesting to, to read what was the cause probably for, for this accident. So the problem is that uh, we have three signals from three different sensors. The sensor is measuring the angle of attack, so, so under what angle the airplane is uh, climbing or descending. And this is the block diagram, how it's, uh, how it's done in the real control system. So here you have uh, the two sensors. You take uh, the median value of uh, all three of them. So this gives you the average, well, not, not average, but it would be the, the median, which is a little bit different in terms of statistics. Uh, anyway, this gives you a kind of average value. Then you subtract or you add the, the average value to all three sensors. And uh, by this, you can get uh, if the sensor gives you similar values like the other ones. So if they are very close together, it means that uh, this value plus this will be very close to to all three others, to all two other sensors. And uh, here they detect uh, what is the amplitude. So this basically detects if uh, the signal is uh, believable. If it is not 
far away from all the others and if it is okay then it goes further as a value now if it is uh, not okay then uh, they will say okay there is a fault here for example on this on this signal if it is far if for example center 3 is uh, farther than the threshold from the two others i will detect a fault so the output signal this is logic signal is a fault signal now uh, they are also accounting here for the factor of time so uh, it's not just one sample but uh, it detects if uh, more samples are outside of the threshold so it's unlike my algorithm that I showed you that it was working uh, basically if the sample was close then it was fine but here they are also taking time into account so if it is far away from longer than some given time threshold then it will signal a fault again this is a, a way how to reduce noise in a real system and uh, the output is combined from those two signals so they take uh, signal one and two and uh, they take the mean of uh, signal one and two and this will give you the output so this is an example of an aerospace system um, in this source you can read more about uh, about this investigation this diagram comes uh, comes from this from this reference so you can see that uh, it can be quite complex uh, to take um, an algorithm like this and to implement it as a, as a safety system but um, it will give us the reliability that we require in those systems and uh, I think this is uh, the example that uh, I just showed you, the one with the, with the angle of attacks. Um, you have this example available in Moodle, so you can run it on your own. It does not require any uh, external hardware, so you can just run it without an Arduino. This is, uh, as a, I would say, a simulated sensor, like a random, random signal that I'm, that I'm generating. Okay, uh, now the next example uh, that I would like to show you is uh, how to use sensor fusion if you want to fuse signals from different sensors. Now, until now, we had a signal that was coming from the signal, well, sensor from the same variable. So uh, we measure the angle of attack, we measure temperature, and so on. But now uh, we will take a look on how to combine two different uh, sensors together. And I will give you some examples uh, if you are building a drone. So let's say you want to find uh, the orientation of a drone. So uh, maybe I'll just uh, begin first uh, with this picture. So this is a drone and uh, you want to fly it. And you want to fly it uh, in such a way that uh, you as a pilot just give some commands uh, if it should be tilted or how fast should it go and uh, you want to leave the stability on uh, the embedded control system so here this is like a 2d view only uh, so we have two propellers this is my control system and uh, I want to stabilize all this uh, in uh, some uh, in some reference frame. I want that uh, this is some y coordinate, this is some z coordinate, and obviously the x coordinate would be perpendicular to that. So I want to fly it either horizontally or I want to tilt it, and I want that it's flying to the right, for example. Now, if you want to build such a system, you need a sensor that gives you info about orientation. And this can be done with uh, different sensors. It can be done with uh, an accelerometer. It can be done with a gyroscope, which we'll see uh, as the next example. And uh, 
If you want to use an accelerometer, you can also use a magnetometer. Uh, another example, if you are not familiar with drones, is uh, for example a cell phone. Now, how does a cell phone find if uh, the screen should be horizontal or if it should be vertical? Well, it has a, an accelerometer that measures the direction of Earth's gravity. It may also have a magnetometer, for example, and it may combine the two signals together. Now, if you're flying a drone like this, another option that uh, may be bonus or maybe let's call it a feature might be that you want to maintain the heading. So let's say I want to fly north or I want to fly south, for example. So I need to measure the direction of uh, the magnetic field of the Earth. And the magnetic field looks like this. You can imagine it in a very simplified way, like a bar magnet. Here is the magnetic field going like that. And let's say we are somewhere here, let's say Germany, for example. So if we are at some position, we measure the direction to the north. But uh, in fact, uh, well, we would like to fly to the north, but uh, in fact the magnetic field line, you can see it's pointing downwards toward, toward the center of the Earth. So we need to make some correction for this so that it's tilting downwards. Another problem might be that uh, the magnetic field uh, of the Earth is uh, relatively very weak. You can find the intensity here, it's roughly 30 microtesla. Here it's about 60 microtesla, so it's very weak. And uh, if you compare it with, uh, let's say, modern permanent magnets, then uh, even permanent magnets, well, they are much smaller, of course, but uh, they have much stronger magnetic field that we measured here. So the problem of uh, fusing those two signals might be that uh, you have um, some noisy signal from the accelerometer since you're flying and you have vibrations and uh, you have also a noisy and very weak signal from the magnetometer. So how do you combine those two signals together? You can uh, improve the, let's say, signal quality at the, at the output if you're combining those two signals. You can uh, simply uh, say, okay, now from the accelerometer I know that uh, it will have noise but uh, it's affected by vibrations but on the other hand it will detect me reliably the orientation and if I want to calculate north I can add the info from the magnetometer so we'll be talking basically only about this block that I've named calculate orientation uh, uh, well right now in a real application, however, you would need to do calibration of both. You would need to calibrate the magnetometer and uh, in most cases you also need to calibrate the accelerometer so that you have uh, zero set. And uh, typically then when you have the orientation you will make uh, a low pass filter so that uh, you keep only the low frequency content and you filter out all the high frequency noise. Uh, why low pass here? The assumption is that uh, this can move relatively slowly and uh, that anything above uh, a given frequency will be the noise. So we will get rid of that. So how to do this? Well, uh, let's imagine here we are at some point uh, of the Earth. And we have our reference frame. We have the x direction, we have the y direction, and we have the z direction. Now the magnetometer gives us the direction to the north pole, like that. Um, but the accelerometer will give us the direction that is going downwards. Uh, this this should point to here to the to the center of uh, of. Uh, of the Earth. So we, we will imagine that the Earth is now uh, one, point, uh, one point in space. Uh, now, uh, if you are not familiar with the terminology of the angles that is used in, uh, in drones and in airplanes, now I will use a term that's called pitch and roll. 
and there is a third one that's called yaw. Uh, the pitch is the angle that uh, you have uh, between the nose of your airplane and down and upwards. So measured from the horizontal axis. So if you're flying forward and then if you, you have, have a pitch of let's say plus 5 degrees, then it means you're flying up with this 5 degrees angle. So this is measured, the pitch is measured from the horizontal axis. Uh, the second angle, roll, is uh, parallel to the fuselage. So you're uh, basically saying if uh, I'm rolling to the left or if I'm rolling to the right. And the third one is yaw, which is like the rotation along the z-axis. So how do we calculate actually this, uh, this direction? Well, we will net need the data from the magnetometer. So, uh, I will assume that XM and ZM, and, and uh, I think that's YM as well, this is the data that I get uh, from the magnetometer. Uh, I'm assuming that I have a 3-axis magnetometer, that's what I will be using on my, on my demo, that, will be in, in, that we will see in a few minutes. So, I have three coordinates of uh, my magnetic field. Now, if I want to calculate the uh, direction of, uh, of the magnetic field in the x-plane, so now this is uh, as a plane, so I take the measured value and I calculate uh, this, basically this formula, cosine and sine of, uh, of the pitch, and uh, I'll do the same for the y-coordinate. Well, however, this will give me the direction in this plane like that. I would like to project this into this downwards direction, so I need the third angle that I have uh, I have uh, available from from the accelerometer. So I will calculate those coordinates. I can calculate the the orientation as, uh, as uh, the arcos tangents of this of these two two values that I have from the measurements. Uh, now let's take a look on, on a live demo. Well, yeah, I will uh, first uh, first show you uh, the, the result and then I will show you the, the video that I have prepared. So again, this is an example uh, in uh, MATLAB and uh, it reads uh, some data through the serial line from an Arduino board. The Arduino board looks like this. Maybe I'll just... Uh, Correct the distortion and make this uh, make this bigger. So um, I will be using this board. Uh, it's the same like I've used uh, last time. Uh, here I have uh, this is an accelerometer, and uh, this is uh, a magnetometer. Oh, no, sorry, this is the magnetometer. In a way, I have. Uh, it's this, this accelerometer works in three axes, this works in three axes as well, and uh, I'm able to read through the serial line uh, the data from this uh, Arduino. And uh, what we will see in MATLAB is uh, basically a cloud of points like this. So uh, I will leave the board on the table with some fixed orientation. And uh, it will give me points, um, points uh, like like this. So here we can see, okay, it's a constant value, roughly an average somewhere around here. But um, it, it's quite noisy because uh, I have vibrations, uh, uh, I have in electromagnetic interference, and so on. So uh, I don't know if if it, it, is it ninety eight or is it ninety seven or is it one hundred. It's somewhere between this this value so we will we want to reduce this noise from our signal and moreover we want to correct the tilt correction and the tilt correction is this if I'm flying with some angle that's uh, non-zero I need to correct the orientation that I have here because with the accelerometer I'm measuring the downwards direction. So with this correction you can see that we will get some little bit different values 
and those are those red points that you can see over here and those red points they are basically following the, the first ones so if it's uh, larger here in the input signal we'll get a larger value on the output signal as well so the points with red are with the tilt correction so I'm mm, correcting for the tilt uh, but this would still not be a useful signal to fly the drone. I would I would might need to filter it out. By the way, this is uh, when it's lying on my table, so uh, there is no vibration from the motors, which would be even worse. So I need to apply some low pass filtering, and that's uh, the example of the blue curve here with, with uh, let's say normal low pass filter normal in quote marks like standard low pass filter and uh, the magenta line here is uh, coming from something that's called the common filter uh, which we will discuss uh, on the next lecture and you will see uh, that this is um, a significant improvement uh, how well this can filter out the signal so let's take a look on uh, the MATLAB um, example. I have uh, prepared the video here. I will again mute uh, the sound and I will just uh, comment what uh, what do we see. Uh, so this is basically the data that I just uh, show, showed you. And uh, now I will uh, do one experiment. Uh, yeah, I, I will uh, get the data in real time through the serial line from the Arduino board. So that's uh, this part of the code that it's it's reading the, the serial data, and then I'm applying the the algorithm uh, that is uh, fusing the accelerometer and magnetometer together, and that's uh, that's this part here. Those few lines. This is calculating the roll and pitch angles from the accelerometers and uh, this is calculating the heading without any correction and this is calculating the heading with correction. Um, again this example you have it available in Moodle so you can take a look on it and you can see that it's not complicated it's really just those three lines that uh, uh, are doing the calculation. Now uh, when I will uh, run it, uh, we'll see um, how this is uh, calculating the signal in real time. Let me just, uh, let me just forward that a little bit. Just talking. Okay. And uh, now uh, what I'm doing is that uh, the board is uh, lying flat on the table and during the sampling I will change the orientation so uh, I will simulate like uh, a movement so uh, here you can see this was when the orientation was constant here there was a transition I just took the board in my hand and move it somehow so that here I have one angle and here I had a different angle can see that initially it has it was a constant angle and here we have a constant angle again with some other value and we can see how the calculation follows uh, uh, the, the step change because that's basically what I was doing I was doing a step change so here the red points are uh, with the corrected uh, orientation for, for the tail so we can see slightly uh, different values but anyway here is a constant value here is a constant value as well and uh, the blue curve is the low pass filter and now the question is is it any good or not probably not that that good because here we can see how it oscillates here it definitely follows the um, the change but here we have a large undershoot and then it would go um, steadily to the correct value which would be somewhere around here and uh, here with the common filter we can see that it filters much more the changes so here we have quite a stable signal 
here it's following the signal but it's too slow and uh, here uh, it would go to my constant value so you can see that this is basically a trade-off between the speed of the filter how good is it in following fast changes and uh, in the ability of the filter to remove the unwanted noise and we'll see that for example the Kalman filter is quite good for this purpose if you tune it correctly so this was an example for the uh, it's called electronic compass by the way and uh, you may find this algorithm also in your cell phones so um, some cell phones they have uh, they have uh, the magnetometer and um, they use the combination of magnetometer signal and uh, accelerometer signal to get uh, the orientation you may find some apps that uh, will act like a compass uh, the next example that I would sh like to show you is uh, again combining the signal uh, with the uh, accelerometer but now uh, we will be combining it uh, with a gyroscope and this is um, again an example from controlling drones if you're controlling a drone in flight uh, the basic well basically the only sensor that you really need is uh, the gyroscope but if you have only a gyroscope you need to fly it on your own manually and you need to correct uh, all eventual motions so for the pilot it's uh, much more convenient to have a control system that takes care of this and you're just sending commands that are saying uh, now fly forward fly backwards roll and do something and it's stabilizing itself the gyroscope is a sensor that measures angular velocity so uh, it can tell you if you're rolling under some angle with what speed the problem of an accelerator of a gyro is that uh, it has a drift so uh, it is not able to measure if you're standing still if you have zero speed then uh, or zero angular speed then in time due to temperature changes due to vibrations and so on uh, your gyro signal will drift so in long term the gyro is suitable to find fast changes of uh, angular velocity so i want to take only the high frequencies of my gyro and uh, the accelerometer on the other hand is suitable for low frequencies so accelerometer can give me info about the orientation when I'm standing still or when I move with some slow changes but uh, in high frequency domain it is uh, distorted by vibrations so what we want to do in such a control system is that we take the low frequency content from the accelerometer plus the high frequency content from the gyroscope and if you want to use a gyroscope uh, to calculate orientation you take the gyro signals and you calculate the integral so uh, this this should be an integral let's, uh, make it, let's move it where it belongs so this should be this should be on top here so uh, I take the signals from the gyroscope I calculate the integral and this gives me orientation but this works only in, uh, in high frequencies so only for for faster changes I sum somehow the signals and then I get the output which should be my orientation uh, you can see that here I'm taking low frequency content and here I'm taking uh, 
high frequency content. So the output signal is composed from both signals, but they have just different frequency bands. And this approach is called a complementary filter. I'm taking complement, uh, taking um, similar signals, but they have different frequency ranges. Now the way this works is uh, that uh, in practice it is uh, a very simple equation. Let's say I want to calculate the angle in some time instant that I call I. So how to how do I do it? I need to calculate uh, the I want to calculate the orientation. So I need to get the angle that I had previously, this is because this is basically calculating an integral. And uh, I will add the signal from my gyro. And this dt is my sampling period. So um, in drones, it's typically in the order of few hundreds of, of hertz. So let's say 400 hertz to a few kilohertz, maybe. And I will add this small portion to my signal that I have from the, uh, from the previous calculation. And uh, this Excel, this is the signal from the accelerometer. And this factor P, this is the sensitivity that I have chosen for the different component. So in practice, P is something like 0 0.98. So this is telling me if I give preference to the signals from the gyroscope or if I give preference to the signals from the accelerometer. Now, in my choice here, I have chosen that P is something like 0 0.98. So I have left 1 minus 0 0.98. So this will be 0 0.02. And this tells me that I give only a very little preference to the accelerometer signal. But I give high preference to the gyroscope signal. And this is up to you to tune what will be, uh, what will be suitable for your application. Uh, if I choose uh, that this number is small, I will give a large preference to the accelerometer signal and small preference to the gyroscope signal. So, uh, well, the small number here uh, will prefer the accelerometer and not the gyroscope. Now, due to the noise, basically it's called drift of the gyroscope then uh, the gyro will drift away in time so basically only the um, AC component of the gyro signal is useful for me in this application so in this specific application if you're drawing drone control now uh, you would prefer the gyro signal and you will correct it in long term in order of uh, few seconds maybe a few minutes uh, with the signal from the gyroscope uh, let's uh, let's take a look again on uh, on some matlab example i think i have uh, uh, here uh, such a, such an example now this is magnetometer uh, where is it uh -huh. Well, I did not. I did not put it there. So, uh, no example right now. But I think I I made one. So I will upload it a little bit later uh, in in Moodle to to uh, give you a chance. This this is like a very simple simple equation. Okay, uh, and uh, now uh, I will begin uh, another topic. Uh, again, I will give you some examples uh, from from drone control because uh, that's uh, where I was uh, I was using all all those um, all those uh, algorithms. Uh, so I will explain you the Kalman filter. Now the Kalman filter is a quite large topic. So today I will just uh, briefly introduce you into the topic. And uh, we will spend uh, the next lecture, 
entirely on the common filter and uh, then about one half of uh, the lecture in two weeks so uh, don't be scared by the math that you will see today it's just uh, an overview what uh, what we will be doing today uh, initially it may look quite complicated but if you try it on your own it's uh, actually not that different from uh, from any kind of controller or better say um, maybe not control it's not maybe the, the good uh, good word but uh, the uh, state uh, state space uh, description uh, of uh, a dynamic system so what is a Kalman filter a Kalman filter is a dynamic filter the word dynamic means that uh, we will be adjusting the setting of the filter so that it can adapt to the dynamics of the system so it will act in in our application it will act like uh, a low pass filter so we want to use it to reduce uh, the noise in our signal and at the same time it will allow us to learn something about the system so it will create let's call it an internal model of the system that will predict the dynamic behavior of the system. So the comma filter is basically a frequency filter, if I can say it so, uh, that uh, has some idea about the behavior of the system. Now it will work as uh, an iteration, so it will run in a loop and uh, it will be sample based. So every sample that we will receive, we will do the algorithm and then we'll wait for another sample. So the output of our Kalman filter in, in my example on the very beginning uh, will be one variable. And uh, we want to get the real value of the variable. And the reason why we are doing this is that uh, in all cases, in all real systems, we have uh, some noise. So we have some uncertainty how accurate was our measurement. We have some uncertainty of uh, how accurate is our calculation because we'll be doing digital calculations. So we'll need to handle uh, the, the rounding. We'll need to handle the limited precision of, uh, of the numbers that we have in the computer and so on. So uh, the point is that we want to gradually approach to the real value of our variable. So if, for example, we measure temperature in a room, we want to get the real temperature in the room. Now the common filter that I will explain to you today and on the next lecture is supposed to work with linear systems. So if our system is linear, in other words, if uh, we can use a linear model to describe it, then it will work well. If we will use it for nonlinear models, then this kind of algorithm will not work at all. And we'll see, uh, I think, in two lectures uh, how to handle that. It will be called an extended Kalman filter. So, so far, we'll focus only on linear systems. Now it will work in a loop and uh, in the first step of the loop we will calculate so-called prediction. So this will be our estimate that we get from the mathematical model. And uh, then when we get the real sample of our measured variable, we will calculate what's called a correction. So we will correct our estimate based on the measured value. And in all cases, we will consider the uncertainty of uh, the variable, and we will consider also the uncertainty of uh, our calculation. So the advantage of the Kalman filter is that uh, it can work with multiple variables. So uh, in my first example, I will show you this uh, as a calculation of one variable only. But uh, the big advantage of the Kalman filter is that you can combine multiple variables. 
let's say you would like to create control a drone and uh, you would have one signal from the accelerometer you will have one signal from the gyroscope then you may add uh, a magnetometer you may add a barometer and you can combine all this into the Kalman filter so it will work as a filter and at the same time if you define properly the, 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 the settings of the model that you have in the Kalman filter it will allow you to create um, an internal model of your dynamic system so in my opinion this is uh, like a huge advantage of the Kalman filter because relatively simply you, you can combine uh, all this into one system which will then be solved with uh, let's say one equation although it will be a matrix equation but uh, it's still not very difficult to, to use that. Uh, in all cases we will need an initial estimate of our signals so we'll need to make an estimate uh, what is the initial value of our variable and uh, what is uh, the uncertainty of this uh, signal so for example if I measure temperature I will measure temperature in the room so I can make an estimate that the, the temperature in the room will be somewhere uh, between let's say 15 and 25 and uh, that I measure it with some temperature sensor which has uh, accuracy of let's say plus minus one centigrade so this will be my initial estimate I say okay probably it's 20 and uh, uncertainty will probably be one centigrade and we will see that uh, another advantage of the Kalman filter is that very soon, after a few samples, it will get very near to the real value and the, the uncertainty will decrease. It is sample based, so uh, we can use it as a digital algorithm. We will obtain the sample, we will calculate the algorithm and uh, we will be able to get very fast to our real estimate. Uh, the, the whole point in doing this filtering is that uh, the incoming samples are not accurate. We have some noise on the signal and we want to get rid of this noise. So if I measure temperature, for example, uh, I will get uh, a reading that it's 20 centigrade but it will be not exactly 20 centigrades, but it will be 20 centigrades plus minus, for example, one centigrade. So I'm always measuring some interval. Uh, here is uh, an example what will happen with uh, the output of uh, your common filter. Uh, so those red points, this is uh, the measured temperature this was an experiment that I was doing um, in, in my room. Uh, we can see that there is obviously um, an error in the, in the measurement because uh, I definitely did not have 25 centigrades. Uh, the reason for this is that the sensor that I've used is uh, just to show you on the, on the picture. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's this one, a sensor like this. Um, you can see the type here ds 18 b 20 and uh, the sensor uh, gets you temperature but it gets you the temperature plus minus 2 centigrades roughly I believe so uh, even though here um, I had something like 22 maybe 23 then uh, it g gave me 25 uh, plus this noise you can see okay it's not a steady value now definitely the temperature cannot change uh, this abruptly so this is this sampling was about one second away so the temperature cannot change like this it's, it's definitely noise so I want to get an average value like that I could use um, the, some moving average for example or I could use a, a normal pass filter uh, and I have chosen to use the common filter in this case so I have made an initial estimate. Let's say that my initial estimate was that it's, uh, let's say, 24 point something. 
and uh, we can see that how quickly the Kalman filter was able to adapt to this value. So we have basically learned the dynamic of the system. And uh, here it's filtering quite well the noise. So we have a quite steady value. And uh, it took like maybe 10 samples to stabilize the calculation. Uh, we'll later see, I think we'll do it on the next lecture, uh, that there is a trade-off between how fast your filter can adapt to the change of your variable and um, how well it can suppress the noise. So either you have a quite good reaction on some change on your signal or you have a good noise rejection. So, what can we do with uh, the Kalman filter? Well, we can filter out the noise. That's uh, our main purpose in this, um, in this um, class. But we can also uh, ignore measurements that are not precise enough. That's uh, related with the filtering. So, if our measurement is really far away, for example, here I would have a sample that's somewhere here. I, it would be ignored by the algorithm because it's very far from all the previous values. If it's just one sample, of course. Uh, we can use it to calculate uncertainty. So we can get an estimate how uncertain we are about the calculation and about uh, the estimate of our measure, measured value. And we can use data redundancy. So uh, if I would uh, again combine, uh, for example, those two signals together, accelerometer and magnetometer, they basically measure, it, well, in this application, in the drone orientation, they are able to measure the same stuff, but accelerometer measures well in low frequencies, and uh, gyroscope measures well in high frequencies. And uh, with the common filter, we'll be able to combine this info together and get say better signal at the output. So let's take a look on how this uh, this algorithm works. So we need to make uh, an initial estimate of our error. Now this is an estimate that uh, relates to the calculation error. So let's say initially I will make an estimate that my measured value is I will use the temperature example, so measured value is, for example, 23. The initial estimate will be, for example, 5 centigrades, and the measurement error will be something like 1 or 2 centigrade. This is coming from the data sheet. Then based on the initial estimate, I will calculate the prediction. So I will predict what can be the value of my variable. And then I'm waiting until I have some measured data. So here I have some measured variable. This is coming from the sensor. I will use this calculation to calculate my new estimate. So my new estimate from the model will tell me what do I estimate is the temperature. And this will be the output of the algorithm right now. And this runs in a feedback loop like this. I take the new estimate that I just made. I will feed it back into the prediction block. I will calculate everything. I will calculate a new prediction. And then I wait for a new measured variable. So this is uh, running in a loop like this. Every time you have a new sample, you update the calculation. That's why this is called update. Uh, you output your estimate and you uh, go back to the prediction and you prepare everything for your new sample. Now, uh, one important block will be this block that uh, we will call the Kalman filter gain. And the Kalman filter gain gives us an idea how well do we trust the measured variable or how do we trust our prediction? So uh, it is giving us the weight between the measurement error 
and between the prediction error. So in other words, if uh, I have a really accurate error, this measurement error will be small. And I will trust in this measured signal. If on the other hand, this measured signal is really bad, I have like really big noise, lar large variance basically, then I will not trust that much my signal that I get from the sensor, but I will trust my prediction. So this gives you a trade-off between how much you trust your measurement and how much do you trust your model. So uh, it is very similar to uh, the weighted average algorithm that we have seen uh, on the beginning of today's lecture. So this gives us a weight, how do we trust the measurement or calculations. The calculation is the model that we have uh, uh, hidden in the, in the common filter. That's the model of our system. So how to do it? Mm, I will need to define some, um, some symbols that I will use. Uh, I will use the signal, a symbol K for the Kalman filter gain. So I will calculate K, which will be the gain. Uh, the prediction error is my estimate of the error of my calculation. The measurement error is uh, my estimate of my accuracy of measurement. So the prediction error, I will need to estimate it. I will make an estimate that my calculation initially can be, let's say, plus minus 5 centigrades. The measurement error, on the other hand, I will get an estimate from the data sheet of the sensor. So I'll take a look in the data sheet. I'll say, OK, it gives me temperature plus minus, let's say, 2 centigrades. And this will be my input as the measurement error in this calculation. Uh, the measured signal in this calculation, I will uh, use the symbol Y. And uh, the estimate will be given by the symbol, symbol X. Now the reason for Y and X is uh, uh, visible later because this will get, use the same symbols like uh, the state space model that uh, we will use for more variables. So here, let's start, uh, let's say we have made our prediction. I will skip now the prediction for the moment. I will go directly to the correction, to the update phase. So let's say I already have my, my prediction made somehow. Uh, so I will calculate the gain of the Kalman filter. And it is a formula like this. You can see uh, I, by the way, is the, the, pre, the, the number of samples. So I will calculate the Kalman gain based on previous samples. Uh, you can see it's a prediction error divided by prediction error plus measurement error. Now I assume that measurement error is constant, so I have omitted here the I symbol. And what is it? What is this equation doing? Uh, it is the weight. So uh, if the value of k is uh, near one. When is it near 1? Well, regardless of the value of, uh, of p, it will be 1 when this value, this value of r, is small. So when I have a small measurement error, if it would be 0, then I would divide p over p, so this would give me 1. So if the value of k is uh, 1, it means that I have a very accurate measurement and I don't care about the model. So in this case, I place my trust into the measured value. If on the other hand, k is zero, then it means that this value of r needs to be very high, it needs to be infinite. And r is my measurement error, so I have a very bad signal. So if I have a very bad measure, measured signal, I will not trust this signal, but I will trust my model. So if k is zero, you place trust in your model and not in the measurement. 
And of course, in reality, it will be somewhere in between. You will have some trust in your model and you will have some trust in your measurement. So this K is nothing else than the weight that is telling us how much do I trust the measurement or the model. Uh, if we are working with a single variable, then this is quite simple. We just calculate the gain like this. And then we use the gain to calculate the new estimate of my variable. And for this, we can use the previous estimate plus, and here we, you can see it's k times the measured value minus my previous estimate. And if you take a look on this equation and you know something about control systems, then this is nothing else than a P controller. So it's a proportional controller. Here you take the measurement, you subtract the previous value. So basically the previous sample. And by this you get uh, the error between your measurement and between your estimate. Uh, by the way, here this uh, this measurement it should go it should go here. It should not it should be like this. Let's shift it for some reason. So this is the current measurement that uh, I have uh, I have made. I subtract what was my estimate originally in the previous step. I multiply it with my gain, so it's telling me how much do I trust my measurement. And I add this to my previous sample. So this will give me my new estimate. And then I feed it back and I do the prediction and calculation again with uh, the new sample like this. Uh, now um, back to my first step that I have omitted on, on purpose here. How to make the prediction? Well, the prediction will again be related to the value of my Kalman gain. So if I have a low Kalman gain, I will place a high trust in my prediction. And if I have a high Kalman gain, which means I trust my measurements, I will have um, low trust in the prediction. And this is quite a simple formula that is doing exactly this. If k is zero, it means I trust my prediction only, my model. So I multiply it by one. This is my previous prediction. If I don't trust uh, the model and I trust the measurement, this will give me k equals to almost one. So I will not trust uh, not trust uh, the prediction. So basically, the Kalman filter for one variable is just those three equations. You calculate the Kalman gain with some initial estimate. You calculate the new estimate of your variable. And uh, then you calculate your prediction. Now, if we will be using it for more variables, we will add a uh, few more equations, about two or three more. But for one variable, it's as simple as those three equations. Uh, we will do a numerical example, but I think I will do the numerical example next week so that we see how this works with some real numbers that uh, you can use them for hunt calculation.